So, welcome everybody. I am pleased to introduce Steve Peterson. He's an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Niagara University, beautiful campus. He's been publishing and presenting on philosophy and ethics uh, of advanced AI for 19 years. He is a very engaging speaker. I talked to people today and said, Steve Peterson's going to be talking like, oh, it's very good. Oh. So I was like, okay, I am excited for this talk because I've never, uh, I've never seen Steve on um, one speak. of his presentations. But they were my cons computer science colleagues, and they're like, it's actually really interesting. Oh, really? The computer scientists? Then. Yeah, they were computer scientists, and like, it's actually very interesting. So <laughs> since about 2015, his main focus has been philosophical and technical aspects of the alignment problem for superintelligence. He's a fellow at the Future of Life Institute and has been supported in AI alignment research grants by, by grants from... Um, Survival and Flourishing Fund, Center for Effective Altruism Long-Term Future Fund, and the Center for AI Safety. His other main area of research involves formalizing scientific discovery using tools from algorithmic information theory. He's also a local part-time actor and improviser, <laughs> though not so much since the birth of his delightful children. <laughs> yes. So one question for you is that, do you, do, did you ever do, any, do, you do anything with like, the philosophy folks at UB? Like um, yes, Barry, Barry Smith and yes, so Barry Smith certainly. Yeah, in fact, we just did a panel together because you know he had this book. Have you seen his new book? I read about his latest book, and I know that Barry has been talking about how all this is like not what it's made out to be. Yeah, so yeah. what an interesting topic. Yeah, so we did. We we yeah. I've I've, I've gone back and forth with him a fair amount. Uh huh. He, he, I'm. I hope he's right. Is basically the upshot. It's it's uh, in me personally. It is amazing to see the CEO and the technical people who be companies and they fall into two camps like one camp is like this is going to go nowhere you're falling you know you're, you're, you're drinking like Kool-Aid essentially and yeah. the other camp is like no no we're really onto something here. It's I mean I would say it's like how many more winters but eventually well, no it's going to I mean it might be another winter it might be zero more winters zero yeah well so, hi, thank you. So, uh, I've gotten to talk to about everyone. Well, you're, are you also faculty here, I'm guessing, based on? No, I'm, uh, I started a business with using AI and sales under products for medical documentation. Yes. Cool. I should have guessed it would happen that fast, you know, but it's just, a, okay, cool. Uh, what's your name? Jacob Mahalski. Jacob, hi. J uh, J I'm, I'm Justin, Justin, right? Uh, I haven't, didn't get your name. I'm Todd. And you have AI just because, I forgot why. Uh, is opportunity. I didn't get your name either, Todd. Jackie. Jackie, and you do you do you do image generation through generative AI. Yeah. Sounds like you have the API set up and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm Ben and I just became interested in AI a few months ago, seeing it everywhere and just right. recently completed a uh, like certificate program through uh, Cornell. Oh cool. Like, and I, and what's the pro what's the program? AI strategy. Right. So it's very broad, like covering a lot of different topics. You know, all of like for a business strategy kind of thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Business strategy. Yeah. And wow. That's interesting. My name is Matt and I'm just learning to code. I'm in a boot camp. I'm learning JavaScript right now. Right. I just wanted to attend right. so that I can know what's going on with AI. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, wonder, like, will there be coder jobs? Yeah, sure. Will there all be coder jobs? That's a really, really good question. I have a friend who thinks it's all going to be prompting, though. We have, it's an industry panel, so we talk to people in industry and we see what they're doing. And I can absolutely guarantee you that smaller outfits, we talked to, what was his name from, uh, it was a few weeks back, uh, Bono, uh, Jamie Bono, and he was from a small startup, a series of startups, and they're using it, they're embracing it, and they're finding that it's... Probably it's probably co-pilot. Yeah, they're using like, um, co-pilot, so they're using it, and they're finding that they're able to hit their targets better with respect to what they can do, and larger companies, every single one of them has got an internal research project where they are exploring and experimenting with it. And if we can, we're going to try to get ACB auction, because I was talking to... Try to get what? ACB auction. No, local start local local start oh, oh, yeah, and try to get them to give a presentation about their... their um, their use of it uh, so far, what they're finding out. And so far, the results have been basically positive. And I myself use it for my research all the time because it breaks the code and I don't want to have to search on Google and find it. Close to me, so so yeah. in that respect, I don't think it's I don't think it's fraudulent bill of sale. I think it does what it yeah. says it's fun. It gets the job. But I guess I mean I, I'm just wondering uh, how useful is that JavaScript? But I think programming helps organize the mind at least. Yeah. Yeah, it's like what we philosophers would call logic. 
um, which I think is a useful tool. Um, so I, I guess I'll, it's going to be a more customized talk, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, I do, as, as Justin said, I do philosophy of AI. Um, so I do sort of like, you, some of you might know philosophy, philosophy gets different reputations in different corners, but the way a lot of philosophy is done in like American English speaking departments is like very math heavy. And so a lot of my background is in sort of trying to, as, as Justin was saying, to like formalize scientific inference with like um, algorithmic information theory and so on. And I've always had AI in the background. I didn't used to call myself a philosopher of AI. My, uh, my early papers in the ethics of AI, like 2004, 2006, those were like stains on my resume. Because at the time it was a joke. Like why would you think about long term like artificial general intelligence? That just seemed like so, so, so inconceivable. And now it's like, 20 years later and suddenly it's a thing. Um, so is it, I noticed I'm on the business and governance and healthcare track, which at first like didn't seem like a natural fit. I feel like I know nothing about any of those three. But in a way, this is like a, this talk is kind of a plea. It's like an awareness plea, the governance. It's about like, it's, it's, it's a little bit like you're going to a climate change talk, I'm afraid. I think a, the alignment problem, as we call it, is urgent and huge and is way less, it's getting much more attention now, as we'll discuss, but um, needs more. Um, so that's the main theme. Now let's see how I advance. I thought just cursors would advance. Nope, technology foils me again. So in the ethics of AI these days, there's kind of emerging two camps, and unfortunately, you know, every culture has to fracture in the subcultures. <laughs> and so, um, and unfortunately, there's sort of like tension between them, which I think is silly, but there's one camp which is what's sometimes called near-term AI. They deal with very real problems very right now. Misinformation, that's supposed to be a picture of misinformation. I was looking just for energy. Autonomous vehicles, surveillance, autonomous weapons, um, algorithmic bias, that's supposed to be a picture of algorithmic bias. I don't know, New York Times. So. Um, these are very real problems and I'm concerned about them. It's just not my expertise. It's not my sort of comparative advantage. I don't work in this, in, in this area. Um, I'm more interested in long term and roughly, oops, the wrong slide. No, that's the right slide. Okay. Uh, what I mean by long term AI is like once we get to, they, has everyone heard this term or no? I'm curiosity. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, no. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to quiz you. I don't want you to feel. AGI, artificial general intelligence. That phrase has just come into common parlance in the last, I don't know, six years or so, I think. But um, I like it because it skirts. The idea of artificial general intelligence, if you haven't heard, is that it's supposed to be, a, uh, roughly, it often gets defined as like an intelligence that can do anything that humans, any cognitive task that humans can do. Uh, yeah. And that's like, is that strong, AI? Well, it's good. So, philosophers do it, or it's different in an important and interesting oh, way. Really? Okay. Uh, let me, yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. So, Justin's asking about strong AI, which is a philosopher's old term for like, computers that genuinely have a mind. Yeah. Whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I'm also a philosopher of mind, and so there's a lot of, I think there are really fascinating, interesting problems in like, when will computers have minds? When will they have moral value? When will they have all these things, right? That's, those are really interesting questions, and I actually am on a bi-weekly group working on like, when will computers be of moral value themselves? Like, what kind of AI would be of moral value themselves? But AG, I think those are fascinating questions, but AGI skirts all that by being purely behavioristic, okay. right? Whether or not that thing has a mind, can it do this, can it do that, can it do the other, can it, it's, all, it's essentially the Turing test writ large, right? Or what Stephen Harnett used to call the total Turing test. Can it do all these things? Of course, we don't ask it to swim in the English channel, whatever, but we ask it to do cognitive tasks. If it can do all cognitive tasks as well as a human or better, then that counts as AGI. And some people think it's here, right? That like the large language models, the most recent large language models, Microsoft famously published a paper called Sparks of AGI, yeah. where they're like, look, this is, we're on the brick. So again, long term, you have to take a little tongue in cheek, right? 20 years ago, it was certainly long term. It's looking shorter all the time. These pictures, if you don't, this is Spielberg and Kubrick's AI, this is Ex Machina, this is her. I like all those movies. Uh, I make my students watch them, or one of them. I, they, they pick. Um, it's not long term. I don't think long term ethics of AI. I think it's fundamentally different. The game is really different when there are agents on the scene that are not humans but are smarter than humans. So I think it's a very different. It's where a philosopher of mind and a formal epistemologist can help, as opposed to like an applied ethicist, the way the previous problems are. 
Um, and I, but I don't think that these concerns are competitor with short term. I mean, they are in a very broad sense in the same way that like climate change is a competitor with social justice, right? Like they don't have, in a way they're probably both scrambling for resources, they both like more resources, but like the fact that I care about long term doesn't mean I don't care about short term and vice versa. Um, so, does that make sense about AGI versus yeah. strong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, again, uh, for, for these purposes, I like AGI because it skirts the hard philosophy parts, which I'm happy to do in other hats. But for this worry, for the alignment worry, um, it's all about what behavior, what is it capable of doing yeah. in a measurable way, right? Um, so the alignment problem, I think the best way to tell the story of the alignment problem is to start with what's sometimes called the effective altruism movement. Um, I'm curious how many people have heard of that. Uh, again, I don't want to put you on. You know what I do with my students sometimes is I have them put their heads down so they're not shy if other people uh. can see you other day. So if you don't mind, why don't you put your heads down? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm going to do a quick I poll. Just, just don't peek at it. Well, close your eyes. That's fine. I can see this. Your eyes. <laughs> now raise your hand. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now raise your hand if you've heard of effective altruism. Just out of curiosity. Okay, thank you. Hands up. One of you. Um, Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? I don't know. Um, it, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm a fan of it, although it's gotten some bad press. It's a long story. Well, you sort of see why it's gotten bad press. Um, the idea, the first idea of effective altruism is very simple. It's just that um, when you're being altruistic, when you're donating money, when you're doing charitable work, you should care about the impact. You should look at the evidence and see whether that impact is actually positive or not. You should be in, as invested in your donation, in your charitable giving, as you are in your retirement investment, right? Like, is this going to get a return? Am I going to, like, am I doing something with this, right? That is a very natural and I think absolutely right idea. But it's, like, morphed over the years in a way I feel I'm kind of fond of, but <laughs> it makes other people nervous. So then you start really, basically, with that idea, you start really crunching numbers. You start looking like, how many quality life years can I buy with a dollar if I buy malaria nets? How many quality of life years can I buy with a dollar if instead I deworm? How many, how many? So you start really crunching numbers. You do expected value calculations, right? And you try to do as evidence-based as you can. Um, now, once you're in that realm of like doing expected value calculations, you start to realize, and this is, these are both philosophers who are kind of fathers of the modern movement, although the real grandfather of the philosopher, Peter Singer, who's famous for like saying, have you ever heard, Canisius might have taught you like the drowning kid example? You got to take a philosophy class, right? Uh, I don't remember. You're supposed to take a philosophy class. I have no idea. Yeah, undergrad. undergrad. I don't know. What are the requirements? I yeah. definitely did undergrad. Okay, yeah. all the undergrads must take it. Yeah. That's why I yeah. advise them. They, they, they still have to take three in Niagara. Three. Yeah. Going down to two this year, though. Um, well, in philosophy, you might have heard, like, there's this famous example of a drowning kid who, like, there's a kid drowning in front of you, and you're like, wouldn't you be a monster if you're like, ah, but if I went to save him, I'd ruin my $10 shoe shine I just got. Forget it. Right? If you can save a life at the expense of $10, you should. That seems like a general principle that doesn't depend on locality, right? It doesn't depend on, like, if you can save a life anywhere else in the world with $10, you should. Right? Um, and he says, we are the moral equivalent of walking by drowning people because we don't want our shoes dirty. And uh, that's, that was, he wrote that in the 80s, but these two have, have um, kind of pushed it further in some ways. So this guy, Will McGaskill, this book is all about, like, look, you know, we might owe future people something. Like, for example, climate change, again, is an example where you, I, you know, not just my kids growing up, but also maybe their kids and their kids. We have to think about future generations. They should weigh in on what is the right thing to do now. They should have some weight on that. But as soon as you start thinking that way, you realize humanity has gigantic potential. We could colonize the galaxy. There could be trillions of humans or human-like creatures. And so, when you think of that, then the fact, this book is all about existential risk the idea that humanity could go out of existence, right? Because of, we're familiar with some of the ways, pandemic is an obvious one, but not more severe, nuclear war, asteroid hitting. If humanity were to go out of existence, we have, that is, I mean, obviously it's catastrophic from any viewpoint, but especially from the effective altruist viewpoint, when you're trying to total up quality life years, so to speak, you have just lost the potential of trillions, who knows how many countless lives, good lives, future lives, 
Because once that is gone, it's gone. You can't make any more. So from the effective altruist standpoint, one of the biggest priorities has become existential risk, even beyond malaria nets, deworming stuff, feeding people. It starts to look like your dollar is better spent instead of saving its life, making sure there's a one in a million chance of a one in a million higher chance of having trillions of people in the future. That's a highly effective thing to do. Not expected value type calculations, right? If you're really crunching the numbers. Um, I should. Put, I started into lecture mode. Questions or? So is that where you ended up? You're more concerned with the future than now. I know. I, I take it pretty far. I, I mean, I am very concerned with the future. I think that it's absolutely right that existential risk is, is, is substantial. How to do the actual number crunching, right. how to weigh tiny probabilities against huge impact, that's an open question that right. philosophers are working on. Absolutely. And not just philosophers, but you know, lots of people are working on. Um, yeah, there's like a fun little paper by one of the people in this field, Nick Boston, if you've heard that name. He, he has a paper called Pascal's Mugging, where he kind of points out how we think. Yeah. It's like Pascal's wager, which you would have had in uh, <laughs> anyway, um, The point is, so this is where we get existential risk. Now, if you read this book, he goes very carefully, these are both philosophers, he goes very carefully through, like, it, you know, I mean, there's only so careful you can be, but it's more careful than I would have done it in terms of, like, what do you, well, how would we estimate asteroid risk? How would we estimate pandemic risk? How would we estimate nuclear war risk? How would we estimate... And he estimates that um, the highest existential risk by far yeah. He gives it about 10% chance of destroying humanity. And that's, that, um, we'll see why. I'm t t part of the goal today is to show why that might be. Um, so I think, yeah, now, the thing about AI, about artificial general intelligence, that it's very easy to forget. I didn't think about it until years, until I've um, gotten into this field is that once it reaches human level capacity, it's very natural to think it will exceed human level capacity by orders of magnitude very quickly. Because it doesn't have the bottlenecks we do this. Like, basically, we're only as smart as whatever can fit through a human birth canal. That was the upper limit on how big a brain it can make for us, right? And it seems like the better, bigger, better, more connected brain you have, the more capable you are of doing intelligent things. Intelligence, by the way, in this context just means Ability to achieve your goals despite a wide range of circumstances, a wide, wide range of obstacles. That's, a, I think, an AI standard notion of intelligence. Just being able to achieve your goals in a wide range of environments. And the super intelligent, by the way, this, this was, I don't know if you can tell, I forgot your name already. Is it Anne? No. Jackie. Jackie, Jackie. Um, you can probably tell this was generated. This was like more than a year ago. I was impressed by this a year ago when a friend might made this for me. And now I'm like, right. But what I like about this image is it's a genie coming out of a bottle, of course. I like the idea of a super intelligence. So we often call that super intelligence in the field, right? Like when an AGI starts to, all you have to do is buy more RAM. I mean, there are some principled reasons to think that it won't scale exactly. But still, it doesn't seem like there's any upper limit on an intelligence for an AI the way there is on human intelligence. So, so, one, so it's like having a genie out of a bottle, right? One of the things it'll be able to do is spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, researching how to build even better AI at speeds unlike anything we can do. <laughs> we can figure out how to do better AI, which can then figure out how to do better AI, which can then figure out how to do better AI. So very quickly, we're going to let a genie out of a bottle. Part of what I like about this image, and this was not prompted, is that it has its own bottle. The robot came out of the bottle with a bo another bottle that has another potential genie in there. Right? Um, that was not prompted by my friend. He's a prompt engineer. I don't know how to do that very well. Um, you might have heard the Arthur C. Clarke claim that any, another reason I like the genie metaphor, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right? Once we have a super intelligence, we literally have a genie. Like, it'll just be able to snap its fingers and make things happen that we have no idea how it would happen. The same way we can snap our fingers and make things happen that, like, chimps and, like, hunter-gatherer tribes would have no idea. It would just be magic to us. It would be technology way beyond what we have. I also like the genie metaphor because we only get one wish. We get one wish, and like the genie of the story, it's going to take that wish super literally. 
in the story, the genie takes the wish literally because the genie's a jerk who resents the servitude and like is trying to screw with you. But in this case, it's because it's a robot, and robots will do exactly literally what we give it as a goal, nothing more and nothing less. And if it's super intelligent, it will achieve that goal with relentless growth, whatever that goal is. We get that one wish, and it has to be written in Python. Or like some, you know, it has to be, it can't just be like, I mean, it's hard enough. There's actually an interesting website where they're like, if you had a genie with a wish who's trying to screw you over, what would you say? It's already hard just to say in plain English a wish that can't be screwed with. Now try to write it up in like code, right? So um, there's already cracks in the bottle here. And the amazing, the thing from like the effective altruism standpoint is if we get this right, if we basically have the right incantation, the right wish, we've designed it with the right kind of goals, it could usher in a new utopia for us, right? It could like cure cancer for us. It could solve poverty. It could figure out new ways to grow food. It could figure, I mean, would worry, would, would solve climate change like that. If we get it right. If we get it wrong, just a little bit wrong, as I'll show later, then that's ending. That's it. That's over. And so the swing is enormous, right? It's either everything's done or utopia. And um, so <laughs> we see why effective altruists are, like, putting money in this. Not as much as I'd like, of course, but um, because... We, as you saw, a few people have heard of effective altruism. But that is one field where they're putting money into this. Okay, so um, this is, here I'm just citing uh, the word is real. This is a Vox article from, oh, the images got all screwed up. The date song. It's by Kelsey Piper, who covers their AI stuff. And this is the sort of money quote. While divides remain over what to expect from AI, and even many leading experts are highly uncertain, there's a growing consensus that things could go really, really badly. In a summer 22 survey, and she, this is GPT-3 years, the median respondents thought that AI was more likely to be good than bad, but had a genuine risk of being catastrophic. More likely to be good than bad, but genuine risk of catastrophe. 48% of respondents said they thought there was a 10% or greater chance that the effects of AI would be extremely bad, e.g. human extinction. 10% of experts think there's a chance of human extinction from AI. I haven't seen Oppenheimer, but like, <laughs> I, they didn't, they weren't working with numbers that high, obviously. So, I, I, is this, I think I had a note about, no, I guess not. Oh, and by the way, 10% is also the number that um, Toby Ord gives. As it happens, that might be why they act. So, I was, about the time, I don't know if you guys heard about these letters. The Future of Life was the first one. They, they had an open letter about pause AI experiments. And, that, and this is the, I'm a faculty associate, I don't know if I'm officially the fellow or what they call me, but I'm part of the Future of Life Institute and I was early sire. Same here. This is one of the groups that's funding me now. And uh, they, so you can see that Jeffrey Hinton, Yashua Benzio, oh, how come the quality is so bad? Dennis Hassavitz, that's the deep mind guy. Yashua Benzio is one of the, that's on the, these two are like really deep learning pioneers. Sam Walton's the CEO of OpenAI. Dario Ode is the CEO of Electropic. Down here is Bill Gates. Um, that I was I have to say, like, huh? So Sam Altman signed out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This statement, and here's the statement: mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. But did you sign the one on the left? Ah, uh, that is a good question. This one, they, what they, I think no. no. I think no. But they did pause. I mean, Sam. I have to say, I don't know what to make of Sam Altman. Like, yeah, right. Right. It, it's so interesting. I didn't realize that he was a signatory on the one on the right. And oh, yeah. He's very... To the one on the left, and he's like, eh. He's testified before Congress, like, yeah. this could be human extinction. This could be game over. He's very serious about it. And actually, I have two philosopher friends who are on the OpenAI staff. Who like, well, one is... He started DeepMind, and then he went to a philosophy degree, and then he left to work at Open. But he, they're both doing it as AI safety people. I do think Sam Altman is very serious about it. And they also just committed like a giant chunk of their compute, a giant chunk of their money to alignment research, which has made me feel a little bit better. But at the same time, everyone seems to think that Sam Altman's the kind of guy who will just do it because he can. He wants to be the guy who makes it. What's that? And regulation market share. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be regulatory capture. It could be that that's what this is about. Here, though, they did agree to pause. I mean, it's kind of a meaningless pause. They were like, yeah, we're not going to train GPT-5. 
but you can call GPT 4.7, 4.8. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Elon? Or? What? Which one? Elon. Elon, I think, signed both. He at least signed this one. Yeah. I don't know Elon wrote that one. No, no, he didn't write This is Future of Life is Max Tedmark out of MIT. And Viga Krakovna is a deep mind and some others. Um, but largely Max Tedmark stuff. Um, and yeah, this is like pause, like let's slow down, let's think about it. This one's just like, you guys, do we agree that it's a yeah. risk, a serious yeah. risk? And like everyone's, all the leaders of the, of the industry, Dennis was out, deep mind, Anthropic, and open AI are all like, yes, we do. Are they doing the half? Well, so cynically you could say it's about regulatory capture, you could cynically say, but I think Sam Altman is what, I mean, have to do it. <laughs> I don't think they have to, yeah. But they don't people were I mean, the on the point is not on the list. The other big, yeah. they must sign it. The other, but, <laughs> no, like, I was just saying to someone earlier, like, Jan LeCun is the lead scientist at Meta, right, at Facebook. He did not sign either of these. He's, he's, he thinks this stuff is laughable. Okay. Uh, so are they missing out on regulatory capture? I doubt it. I, I think Sam Altman genuinely believes, and I know Yasuo Benzio and Jeffrey Hinton do, they don't have any alternative. But yeah, I think Sam Altman genuinely believes, and I think Amade, he started in yeah, I think. A lot of them, there's these weird irony where a lot of them started in this because they wanted to do it, make sure they were the first to do it right. Yeah. So they could do it right. They want to make sure it's safe because there's arm race dynamics, right? If, it, so, um, yeah, so uh, other people, so Stephen Hawking, before he died, signed an early letter that was like this. Max Tegmark, the physicist, if you respect physicists, if you respect entrepreneurs, Dustin Moskowitz from Facebook, who donated a lot of money to these causes and signed these. Jan Collin, who invented Skype, has been a big funder in this area. Elon Musk, of course. Notoriously, Sam Bankman free gave something like $15 billion for the effective altruism movement. That guy turned out to be a mess. But, um, like last summer, I heard his name all stuff, like people were talking about him. I was visiting the Future of Meta Institute at Oxford, and I heard his name like twice a day, I feel that, because he was just pouring money. And that, I can't see, I think his heart was genuine there. I can't see the, yeah. the, the upside on that yeah. for, for, for him selfishly. Um, and it hurt the field a lot when, when FTX collapsed, yeah. Do you think, like, why is this invention going to be a private invention? A what? A private versus public. Why did the government take this first? Right? I, like, I think they can't. I mean, they don't have the... I don't so know. Most my things, is like, like, I have most significant inventions that have been, but, like... Or dark uh, Yeah, it's yeah, all been government funded, right? So did yeah. so they already get here, and they say, now nah, we're good? That's a good question. I don't really know. I mean, I, myself, I'm a... My instinct is to be more worried by governments doing it. Because yeah. then you Absolutely. definitely have race coming mm -hmm. Absolutely, right? Then we'll have Russia versus China versus us, right? Yeah. So but I think they just don't have the resources to compete. There's not enough funding to hire the top. I don't know, but my, you guys would know better, but my impression is they don't have, the government doesn't have the kind of funding to compete for the top AI researchers. So I don't know. I think know. they've been working in the field, too. What's interesting is that a lot of people in the private sector, like, it's valuable when someone has DOD we're leaving yeah. the DOD yeah. to go to the private sector. So the DOD did forecast. I think the DOD has more than a lot of money. Into autonomous uh, vehicles, for sure. Autonomous vehicles. So you are, see, and they had something called, they had something called artificially joint vehicle autonomous vehicles. Yeah. They had something called artificial joint artificial intelligence center. And their stuff was more focused on, we're going to apply this, and we're going to get autonomous vehicles. Right. They want to do things that we can get to the war quite quickly. And if it's something like, well, wouldn't it be great if you could give a capability to an intelligence analyst that could read it out 100 documents and answer all their questions? They'd be like, yeah, let's Maybe. do something more. We have plenty of human labor. <laughs> I think so it basically fell down. Yeah, like the yeah, food chain. Yeah, so yeah. those two things are like the one that come to mind. Yeah. And now, if this were, if this, if, if this were like, um, if it were, say, 2003, were in an active conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, so then it's a completely different story. And somebody comes to the DOD and says, I got some potential here for this to work. I tweak funny. this language model. They are absolutely funny. But today's day and age, it's more about like, we're not necessarily out of war. We're not out of war. So we're like, you know, we're yeah. more like comparing. So that's I honestly haven't thought about that's it. That's just a guess. It's interesting. I, I haven't thought about government actors in this realm. I would have expected it though. I do remember, potential. like seven or eight years ago, I was at an early conference for this stuff at NYU and, and someone was like, um, what if there's a secret lab somewhere, right? 
And Gary Marcus, who's like a AI voice, he was like, no, we know where all the top researchers are. Yeah. That's impossible. No one's gathered that much talent without right. anyone else. That's a, which is a bit reassuring. But I we did look at it. There was a um, there was a program called DARPA Semaphore that was all about detecting misinformation, and it focused on like fake. Um, and it's still an ongoing running project, and it focused on like identifying pictures that were fake and like text that was fake. And they were looking at the they were looking at ChatGPT in, in its early phases. They were looking at the output of it, and they were saying it's interesting. But then when you see the leap that it made between November of 2021 and November of 2022, I don't think anybody expected that. No. And I don't think that the engineers in OpenAI expected that. No. I'm, I'm pretty tough. Tough. I have and then all the people, second. the people who came out and basically said, "You should have not released this." If you were an engineer who developed it, yeah, right? Who thinks you would go to like some artificial intelligence institute and say, "Can you look this over before I release this in the world?" And be like, uh, "I'm going to go release this thing because it's really cool and it, it's it's really neat and yeah. it has so much potential that you're just not going to do that." But it's really like that's if that's what drives Sam Altman to to produce AGI, then yeah, I, that's what worries me. Is I, I mean, I admit it's cool. It's been a dream of mine since I was a kid. But like, yeah, it's been really like a process of grieving for me. This is an interesting. So I, like a year ago, for the first time, I've been thinking about these things for alignment in particular for, I don't know, a little before the first big book, Super Intelligence, came out, about 10, 12 years ago. But it was always like purely theoretical. It was just very interesting to me. Yeah, theoretical the way climate change sort of feels theoretical, right? Like, oh, in the future, this could be a problem. I might be able to help. Last year, I was like starting to fear for my children and like it started to bleed into my emotional life. And like, I was really worried. I mean, you know, nobody, like you say, nobody expected language models to take off the way they would. And I, I mean, yeah, it was, I was depressed. Like, I had read a, a thing of Sam Altman that seemed like he said, and this kind of thing happened. So this is an interesting, so this is, um, Somebody can pause He says, there's an expert who says that if there's not an indefinite pause on AI development, literally everyone on Earth will die. He's quoting Eliezer Yukowski, who is a very smart, thoughtful person who has been beating this drum for 20 years now. And Eliezer Yukowski, shortly after that first letter, wrote a Time article where, yes, he said this. And he does believe it. He puts, in this community, people sometimes, tongue in cheek, talk about P doom, the probability of doom. Like, what's your, what's your estimate of like, whether we're going to make it through this? And Yukowski famously puts it 99 point something percent. Um, a lot of, like, Altman puts it at something like 20 percent, I think. But yeah, so he quotes Elias Yukowski, the press corps laughs, the press secretary says, oh, haha, ha, your delivery is so funny. A month later, same guy, this is after the second letter, the case letter. A group of experts now say that AI poses an extinction risk right up there with nuclear war and pandemic. Crickets in the audience, the press secretary. Oh yeah, it is one of the most powerful technologies of our time. We have to mitigate risk. We brought, we brought CEOs to the White House. Companies need to be responsible. Like in the space of a month, the Overton window went like that, which made me feel better, I have to say. I, like that to me was a relief. But like, cause this is, I mean, someone reminded me, I don't know, it's really godly, but like, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you. Then they fight you, then you win. I hope we win. Uh, we could also just be taken over. Um, I, I'm feeling better. The letters make me feel better. Chuck Schumer is on it. That makes me feel a bit like it's on. It's on people's agendas. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't know if that's going to turn into funding or not, but I hope it does. And, and so the sec I, this part, I'm just trying to convince you that this is important. How many? We're supposed to go to seven. Is that right? Seven, or? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're kind of doing questions as we go. That's fine. Yeah. So the, that first part is like, it, you guys align with important and curious stuff. In my experience, it takes a long time. So again, I went through this grieving process. Like when the worries first came out, I thought I had good philosophical responses. Oh, super intelligence won't be like that. Will be, and the more I banged my head against it, the more I realized, no, this is a problem. And this is actually a common thing in the field. Like people, when they come to alignment, they're like, oh, this is easy. All you have to do is bubble. And then they realize other people have done that. And they're like, oh, okay, no, that won't work. Oh, okay, no, you just have to. I don't know. It takes about like six years before people start to settle into like, okay, this is a really freaking hard problem. And I'm going to try to give you a taste of why. I mean, first of all, there's philosophical issues. Like, what does it mean for a system to have a goal? That sounds very abstract, but like, 
It makes a difference if the large language model has a goal or not. It's trying to do something. And if it's in particular trying to do something in a way that would thwart what you would want it to do. Right? Right now they seem innocuous. Right now I would say, I, I put this in terms of agency. When do you have agents that are achieving goals in the world? And most importantly, when are they trying to achieve goals in a way that they have what are sometimes called convergent instruments? So any powerful agent, if it has some goal, it's also going to have, automatically going to have sub-goals like staying in existence. Because if it can't stay in existence, it can't perform that further goal. It'll automatically want to gain power because making gain power makes it easier. It'll automatically want to know more about its environment because gaining in knowledge will make it easier to attain that further goal, right? So like when you have something with a real goal and a lot of power, it's already going to be like um, a problem. But when does something have a real goal? Does a large language model now have a goal? If so, what's the content of that goal? Is it to help people? with their, you know, I ask it math questions, it helps tutor me in math. <laughs> is, it, is that its goal? Or is its goal to, like, make human-like speech? Or is its goal to minimize the loss function on token prediction? Right? <laughs> What's its goal? Is it just to make this number smaller on the loss of the prediction error? Or is the goal to help people? Or is, what is, how do we figure out what the content of a goal is? These were purely philosophical questions, and they've become much more real <laughs> very fast. This is, about, this is about agency, this is about philosophy of mind, mental representation. When is something about something else, and what is that physical system? How can a physical system be about something else? This is essentially the alignment problem. I mean, in a way, this is all the alignment problem. But I'm going to focus on this one. What goal, suppose we could somehow give it exactly the goal we wanted, what goal would we give it? That turns out to be a really hard problem. Um, and then, like, what, I mean, this is a similar one, what do you, we don't even know what we want. We hear and haul about our own values. Like, what's really important to me? I don't know. Should I be home with my kids right now instead of giving a talk on AI? Should I, like, what are the priorities? What's really important to me? I don't know. How am I going to teach a machine to know? How could a machine, just by my behavior, learn what I value? Even if that behavior includes me telling it what I want. <laughs> I might be wrong. And then, even if we solve that, Sometimes people want to, you might have noticed, conflicting things. How do we get an AI to negotiate that? No. These are heavy-duty philosophy problems again that like, aren't going to be solved by a few lines of code. Um, so we're going to focus on, problem, on question three, which often is called the alignment problem. We get to design an alien t intelligence. How do we give it goals compatible with our future? An alien superintelligence, something that whatever goal we give it, it's going to achieve it with amazing power. How do we give it a goal that's compatible with our human flourishing, as I like to put it? Whatever that is. Who knows what human flourishing is? But whatever that is, we want the superintelligence to endorse it rather than rob it of something. So, in my experience, the initial reactions to this, I put this slide back up because I think sci-fi has been doing us a disservice here. And the reason is, it's natural enough in sci-fi, they're trying to tell stories, but the sci-fi AIs are all human. Human-ish. In, in importantly misleading ways. It's natural because, of course, in the end, we're humans, we're interested in human stories, so the AI should be like humans. It's often like a Pinocchio retelling, right? Oh, I wish I were human like you guys. I wish I had human specialness the way you do. <laughs> like, that's, that makes good storytelling, but it doesn't make good prognostication. It doesn't really picture what AI is going to be like. Right? Anthropomorphizing this leads in two powerful ways. One, we forget that AI could be not, won't just be human level intelligence, but way smarter very quickly. And two, we forget that it won't have human like values by default. Over and over, I hear people say like stuff like, why don't you just turn it off? No, you're forgetting that we're talking about something supremely intelligent. And if it's really intelligent, it's not easy to turn it off, because it knows you want to turn it off. And it knows how to stop you. And other people will say, if it's really that intelligent, why would it do something that's so disastrous for humans? Well, because we told it to want that thing that turns out disastrous to humans. That's why. It might know that that's not what, what you would like or you would like, but if that's what we told it to do, that's what its value is. That's what it's going to do. It's not going to be built with human-like values unless we manage it. It won't default, just like it won't, you know, these machines won't like sugar. That's a biological accident. 
that we happen to enjoy sugar because it helps us survive, essentially. It did once. Um, these things won't by default enjoy sugar, and similarly, these things won't by default be pro-social. They won't by, by default worry about what other people think. They won't by default care if, if they're cooperative or not. They are an alien intelligence. They are not going to be human. This is closer to the truth. This is a common meme in my circles. Shoggoth is like this monster from, from the Lovecraft stuff. I've never read it actually. But um, this is a New York Times article about the, the, the meme that's going on. So GPT-3, this is the reality. Language models are freaking alien. They've been trained with reinforcement learning from human feedback to have a little human-like face so that they look friendly. But there is nothing like a human under there. It is an alien intelligence. It is fundamentally different from us. It does not have human values. It's been painted over with some human-like values on top through, human, through reinforcement learning by human feedback. And even that, of course, as you may have seen, it has holes in it. So, if it's an alien intelligence, why is that? If it's just a little different, why is that dangerous? Um, well, this is the best way I know to explain it. Um, it relies on this old principle called Goodhart's Law, which I didn't learn about until I got into a lot of it. But I think it's a nice way to explain it. Goodhart's Law is this old sort of law of business or economics. I don't think people heard it. Uh, but the idea is, I like this statement of it. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So if, like, if I pay you by the number of nails you make, you are now incentivized to make nails as tiny as you can because you'll get paid for it. The measure is the number of nails. If I pay you by, oh shoot, I should have paid you to make bigger nails, but by the weight, then you'll just be incentivized to make larger nails. Right? This, once you think about Goodhart's Law, it shows up everywhere. Like GPAs, that's an easy example, right? Everyone knows, GPAs are supposed to measure your learning. But everyone knows that like, they're gameable. And in fact, if you really worry about your GPA, you will not learn a thing because you'll take easy classes that you can ace. The measure became the target and it ceased to be a measure of learning. It became its own target. Does that make sense so far? This is a tricky concept, I think. Here's a couple more examples just to give you an idea. This is this one, Gilbert cartoon. Our goal is to write bug-free software. I pay a $10 bonus to every bug you find and fix. If you think for a second, why are the engineers celebrating? <laughs> You may just write bugs and then fix them. That's what you've just been incentivized to do. The, the, tar the real goal was good, clean software. But the measure was eradicating bugs, and they will maximize the measure, not the goal. Right? Because that's the incentive you gave them. Here's another real life one. Argentina, um, so I guess this is the oldest. No, well, not really. Um, but, so... Inflation is partly indexed to like the price of Big Mac, so Argentina artificially changed the price of Big Mac in order to manage inflation. That's again a good mark, right? Like that's again changing, meeting, meeting the target in order to change the measure. Okay, so let's see this in practice in AI. So this is like a simulated physics environment. This is, um, and they wanted to evolve bodies and they can move and stuff in this physics environment and achieve goals. In this case, the idea was, the goal was jump. And they define jump as high center of gravity. Look at this jump. What a beautiful jump. It's got a high center of gravity. Therefore, it jumped by the definition given to it. By the strict measure of the goal of high center of gravity, that is a beautiful jump right there. Because it has a high center of gravity. It just evolved that. So then they thought they got these things, and they thought about that for a second, and they thought, okay, that's a mistake. We don't want it to be high center of gravity. What we mean by jump is the part of you that's lowest should be as high as possible. So then it did this. Can I get it to play? Shoot. How do I get to play? Am I have to do it on that screen? This is a movie. Oh, no. Come on, play. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's moving. Look at this jump. Didn't go up at all by any intuitive standard. All it did was flip its back over. The center of gravity went down. But if you define jump as take the lowest part and make it as high as possible, that's a beautiful jump. It's hard to define jump. And now we've got to define happiness, human flourishing, in a way that you can't gain, that you can't system. Right? System. You can't gain the system. Here's another quick example. I'm running out of time. Um, so, what's that? So, what was 
how is this, what are the definitions? How are they, how are they encoding the definitions? So for the first encoding of the definition, they wanted something that could evolve, a, that could reach a high center of gravity, so the creature just became taller. Okay. That was a poor definition of jump, they realized. So then they decided, oh, what I mean by jump is it's a motion where the part of your body that was the lowest becomes high, the higher the better. That's a good jump. Of all the natural a physics simulator that can get the lowest part of its body high. So it just flipped forward, which isn't intuitively anything like a jump. The center of gravity went down. But it meets the measure, just not the target. Right? Um, here's another example from, uh, how did I get to run last time? And how do I do it again? So this is like, they're trying to train a neural net to pick up a ball with a claw by human feedback. But, and this is an interesting difference because it's human feedback, the thing is the human can't tell the depth, so it reinforced it any time it was like hovering over the ball, even though it was like a couple of feet away from it. It looked to the human like it was grabbing the ball. So it got reinforced to do that. It learned very quickly to just pretend like it was grabbing the ball. And the human was like, thumbs up, great job. Humans were like, thumbs up, great job. Right? And so the lesson here is that when we train AI with human feedback, we're often implicitly designing them to deceive us without knowing. We won't know. It, it will meet what looks like, it will do what looks like it's meeting the goal. Whether it's really meeting the goal, it's hard, it's gonna be hard to tell. Here's the last one. There's a famous hard thing in AI is Montezuma's Revenge, because there are sort of incremental rewards along the way, but AI's gotten good at it lately, of course, um, like so many things. And, um, and this is just one instance. Of course, they were training it on the score. At the end of the day, the target was, the, well, the goal is to become good at Montezuma's Revenge. The way that was measured was score, right? And here's what happened. It turns out if you exit and re-enter this one room nine times or something like that, there's a button in the code where a key appears, and you can just exploit that key. AI figured that out. No human knew there was a bug in the code like that. But what kind of bugs do we have to exploit? It will do what it takes to maximize. If we tell it this is the number, you, this is what you care about, it will do what it takes to get that thing that we told it to care about. Not being mean, not trying to be a jerk, just that's what we told it to try to do. So you see why this is called the alignment problem. If we tell it something that's just slightly off from what we really want, it's going to optimize hard in that direction. <laughs> the Amelia Bedelia problem. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but except, yeah, I mean, the AI takes everything super literally. But like, I mean, even if we had a sort of do what I meant, not what I said architecture somehow, what would we tell it? Yeah, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Huh? Yeah. Um, aren't we already, hasn't this already happened? In the sense that these generative, I don't, I don't think so, but I'm <laughs> blown off since I'm not saying this, but the genetic models at the moment, no one really knows what they are, right? Yeah, they're so black boxes. They're black box. Yeah. So at this point in time, this is already... Yeah, we don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, so Yudkowsky likes to say, the guy who's trying, yeah, yeah. Yudkowsky likes to say, like, look, these are giant floating point matrices. Stupendously huge floating point matrices. Things utterly inscrutable. The worst possible scenario for the kind of AI that come about. There's a lot of work now in so-called interpretability, where they're trying to probe the, the neural networks in a way that makes them like, oh, I see, it's thinking this when it does that. It's you know trying to make sense of what those matrices are up to. But they are you know, hundreds of billions of parameters floating in in, in linear algebra space. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, utterly inscrutable. That's a problem, according to me. Yeah. Some people, like Sir Russell, is actually advocating more like going back to what they call GoFi, like language, traditional language written, because it's at least scrutable. Yeah. <laughs> With the problem of like giving it directions, you see that it can be a vocal minimum, which it thinks it's found out in the solution, because it could explain what I Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, that's going to be possible. I mean, in theory, the more intelligent it gets, the more, the better it is at getting out of local minimum. But, like, I mean, unless that local minimum happens to be one that lines up with what we actually want, yeah. it's going to be a disaster either way, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, like, the way Yukowski sometimes put it is, like, there is value space, so to speak, is huge. Like, what something could value. And you might have heard of the thought experiment of the paperclip maximizer. Does that sound familiar? It's from Nick Bostrom, who's a philosopher who started working on it. And it was just, I mean, you know, it's become a joke, but the point was just, like, look, there is no in principle reason a supremely intelligent system could not want more than anything else in the world to make more paperclips. It's not contradictory to intelligence. It's contradictory to human intelligence. No human would be like that. But that's the point. These are aliens we're talking about, right? They might really just, if we tell them to care about paperclips, they will care about nothing but paperclips. <laughs> because they're not also designed to like sugar and sex and the things that we have to like. <laughs> yeah. Why are we not, why is the assumption that Yeah. Well, you're you're framing at this point in time is we program it or we ask the question. Yeah. You're right. That's a good thing to press on. I am taking for granted. Well, I'm not taking for granted. I learned the hard way. Uh, my initial proposals were something like that. How could we get it to learn? Actually, the title that you saw the similar cost yeah, yeah. machines yeah. learning values. How can we get the machine to figure out what's actually good, so to speak? All I can tell you is I've given up on that project after banging my head on it for like five or six years. Yeah, yeah I'm not giving any expertise. No, no, no. It's a great, it's a great question. It's a great, it's again the question I pursued for a long time. Because the definition of good is arbitrary. No, uh, although maybe, but I. You can make the philosopher sad when you say that, but um, <laughs> uh, no, not because of that, but because whatever good might be or not be. Um, I think it's in the nature of a final, whatever, when an agent comes into existence with a goal, it has no reason, it could have no reason to change that goal. Not on purpose. Of course, it could get its head knocked over, and then maybe that'll twiddle dials in a way that the goal is different now. But could it design itself to change a new goal? No. Because that, I mean, of course, yes, you could have it like try to find one hash and then try to find another hash 10 seconds later or whatever, something like that. But that's not really changing the goal. What you're really, what it always wanted was to hash to this number in this, this particular number at this time. Whatever that goal was, it can't have, by definition, sort of, it can't have any reason to alter that goal. Right? You know what I mean? I mean, this is the point that goes back to Aristotle. It goes back to Hume. It goes back to, like, sorry, what were you saying? You should do something like just set up multiple goals and say, hey, I'm periodically checking on this other goal. And you invest all your interest in sure. solve this goal. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, that was another route I pursued, was essentially multi objective optimization. Yeah. And either you, like, either you scalarize that, in which case there's really just one goal, it's just a very complicated one. Or you've got this Pareto frontier and it's got to somehow decide among all these goals what to pursue when. Either way, you're stuck with, like, similar problems. These are great suggestions. As I say, I pursued them. I'm impressed that you came up with them off the top of your head. And, but again, as I say, like, the alignment trajectory tends to be you start with these suggestions, you spend five or six years on them, and then you're like, yes. I mean, it's hard. I have no confidence that this is going to be anywhere close to solved in, like, 20 years. How do you see it? I don't think about it. I mean, I'm in denial most of the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in like many different languages and talk groups and talk like that. And one thing that came up was probably a year ago, um, I was thinking about graph versus and how sometimes like you get graph is when you get like an organ or something implanted in your body actually oh, oh. So I've wondered often with this technology, which is often in like male dominated fields, um, it worries me to see signatories that have the most vested interest in mm. this stuff um, actually, you know, being pervasive, also being the keepers of like the safety of it. Because what if humanity in general actually is rejecting some of these technologies, especially yeah. AI, but yeah. we don't actually have the capacity to overthrow or outweigh those sectors that like That's the thing. Yeah, that we need the political will. That's why I feel like I was kind of gratified that I'm on the business, health, and governance track after all. Because, yeah, this is about political will. It's like climate change. Okay. But they, they also had the, um, was it the least or some government agency, and just a general, actually, I think IARPA did, that was just basically, what are your concerns for AI? 
And it was like just like an open call. Open concern. call. Anybody, face of the planet, open call. What are yeah. your concerns about yeah. AI? Yeah. And it was along those lines of like it felt anything under the sun, and they just wanted to get a deal for it. And there are your, the most notable signatories on there are the big CEOs, but there are lots of partly because of the funding that has started to come in from this effective altruism movement. There are lots of not-for-profits. There's one at Oxford, there's one at Cambridge, there's one at Berkeley, there's one at MIT, there's one at Princeton, there's one. I mean, yeah, they're all over the place. So there are divested interests, so to speak, that are trying hard to solve them. Um, Yukowski has his own called the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. That's one of the top think tanks. But like, you talk to the people there, they're doing like crazy abstract. I mean, I think it's fascinating. I love everything about like. Partly, my interest in this, frankly, is it's just intrinsically fascinating. Aside from the fact that it might like help save humanity if you do that, but like, uh, it's just. I mean, the research involved in this. I've just got a couple more slides. We might as well finish. We're almost there. Um, oh, but did you have? No. No, I just want to point, okay, it's 7 o'clock. The, the last... That's fine. Typically, it's over a little bit. Don't worry. Keep okay, well, it, just, it really is just a few more slides. So, that, yeah. actually, it was Yukowski who early on, like early 2000s, he was saying these concerns. And one AI researcher was like, look, you know, pretty soon, we're going to have image recognition. They had already kind of caught about the deep learning type stuff. Like that. Pretty soon, we're going to have image recognition. This isn't going to be hard. We'll just, you know, it'll, it'll recognize human smiles. We'll reinforce it with human smiles. But if you think about what the perverse instantiation is there, if you teach it like what you're most reinforced by is smiles, like this is the solution, right? As Yukowski puts it, tile the universe with tiny smiles, with smiles as tiny as you can make. And if you fix that to be human, sorry, I meant human smiles. I mean, again, this was a serious, I mean, presumably they hadn't thought about it for months, but there was a real AI researcher who was like, oh, no problem, align it. We'll just, it'll be reinforced by smiles. This is the solution if you reinforce it by smiles. Oh, no, I meant human smiles. This is a gross slide. I'll just give it a... Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I looked up rictus, and I was like, yep, that's what I want. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> but, again, like, and it's, again, it's not out of malice. It's not that the AI hates us like Terminator movies. It's just that that's what we told it to want, and then it will want that thing. And it will be very, very good at getting it, because we're super intelligent by, by stipulation. So, again, we're back to these questions. I'm trying to reinforce the idea that alignment is hard. Nick Bostrom ends his 2012 book with this chapter called Philosophy with a Deadline, and that like line makes me stutter. <laughs> like, philosophy with a deadline. Like, we have to solve these problems if we want AI to come into existence. Ethics problems that have been around for literally thousands of years. I mean, tens of thousands, but in writing, thousands of years. And you've got to do it in Python or whatever the hell. We've got to operationalize it. And, yeah, I can just tell you, like, the crazy kinds of problems that come up. I mean, uh, again, I, in a way, I love it as a philosopher. But, like, you start as a, as, a, as a software engineer thinking, I just have to code this up. Oh, you know what? I really have to figure out what this would be. Oh, I really have to. And, like, right away, you're in these crazy abstract realms of, like, what is agency anyway? What are goals anyway? What is, like, value anyway? What are any of these things? And how can I code it? We need computer scientists, economists. This is all problems I've run into. I've, I've, I was like, ah, I wish I knew more, more economics. I wish I knew more computer science. I wish I knew more psychology. I wish I knew more neuroscience. I wish I knew more math. Maybe it's doing stuff with like category theory and making up new forms of probability to deal with like different kinds of measures and I just can't follow it. Moral philosophers, of course we need. Formal epistemologists like me. Decision theorists turns out to be big. Policy, Yukowski, by the way, calls himself a decision theorist. He never finished high school, I think, but but he's written stuff that would easily get a PhD in decision theory. Um, policy wants we need policy wants we need PR experts we need awareness we need engineers and we just need everyone to be more aware. So that's what like I'm on my stump about. So these are some resources. That's the last bit. These, this is a really good readable book about both near-term and far-term AI called the Alignment Problem. Um, this is Stuart Russell is one of the like he wrote the literal textbook on AI with with. Amy? How do you say his last name? Andrew N N G. I never know how to pronounce it. Um, anyways, I'm so serious, but Sir Russell founded the Center for Human Compatible AI. I got a little hat from them somewhere. Um, Sir Russell is one of the was one of the early like godfathers of AI. He's like, you guys are serious. We have to do something. And he wrote a very good book. And this is the original, from my perspective, anyway, philosopher Nick Foster, who wrote this book, Superintendent. 
Um, this is a link to 80,000 Hours, which is a web page. It's a web page of the effective altruism movement that's like, here's how specifically with alignment somebody, anybody with certain, whatever your skill set is, they get most of it. And that's my web page. That's all the slides I had. So, okay, five minutes over. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, I, I'm, I, uh, as you can tell, I feel strongly about it, so I'm glad I was Thank you.